Hello, everyone, uh, to next session of the Apache Airflow Summit 2021. Uh, now we are going to have a discussion panel about security, uh, security of the Apache Airflow and how to make your deployments secure. Uh, today, uh, like my name is Tomek, uh, Tomek Urbasek. I'm PMC of the Apache Airflow project. And today I have with me uh, Dolly Fari, uh, who is uh, in his free time is an open source researcher, uh, open source security researcher. And despite being beating, being relatively new Airflow user, uh, he's already uh, involved in a security discussion around Airflow. The second uh, speaker is uh, Ash Berlin Taylor, who I suppose many knows, uh, who is a PMC member of the Apache Airflow project. Uh, Ash was responsible for responding to most of the security uh, issues against the 1.10 really serious. And in his prior career, he was responsible for running large government web services, including the security of them. And finally, we have Jarek Potyuk, also a PMC member of the Airflow project, uh, who, was, who is recently involved in Airflow security issues handling. And he wrote uh, in a few days ago, uh, security in practice blog for the success at the Apache service. Welcome folks to the uh, security uh, discussion panel. It's really good to have you here. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you. So uh, I would like to say that uh, we are going to split this panel into three uh, parts. First, we, want, we will discuss uh, how the security works in general in the Apache Software Foundation and especially in Apache Airflow project. And we will discuss some <clears throat> recently published CVs and uh, what was the case behind them. And, and then we'll try to cover some know-how and best practices of the Apache Airflow. But then uh, we will have some time to answer the Q&A, uh, to do some short Q&A. So please post your questions uh, in the uh, ask a question uh, chat or on the uh, Slack channel. So let's start uh, with probably an interesting question. Uh, let's say that I'm an Airflow user and I'm deploying my Airflow. Uh, I'm managing my instance myself. And I found some uh, security issue. Like there is something that exposed my data, exposed some uh, possibility that can, someone can log into my instance. Oh, there's a lot of things that could happen. And I would like to uh, inform, uh, like submit an issue and inf give this information to the file and security vulnerability to uh, to the project. How should I do that? Yarek, could you describe this process a little bit? How, what should, what steps I should I take? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think, the best person to answer that is is Dolev because he did he did that. I've never uh, raised the security issue to to Apache Airflow. It, it starts with an email, uh, and uh, I see mostly the, the, what happens next. But maybe Dolev says like what's kind of uh, yeah sure I can I can take that. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I'll talk um, about Airflow specifically in a, in a minute. But in general, when you find vulnerabilities in open source software, the first thing that you want to do is go to the Mitre website which is basically the, the, the organization behind the whole CV idea. And they work with companies and, and nonprofit and also vendors uh, to issue those CVEs for their products. So if you go on the website and you look for, say, Apache, you will see Apache being a organization that is uh, what's called like, a, like an authority uh, uh, issuing, like a, basically a CV issuer uh, that is authorized to uh, assign CVs for their products. So that's the first thing that you would do. You don't even need to necessarily go to the Airflow website to figure that out. But even on the Airflow website, there is a dedicated like security page that basically tells you exactly what you need to do when you find something that is of a concern. So the first thing that you do is, is basically reach out over email and then the whole uh, triage process is happening on the other side and that's where the Airflow team is kind of taking over. So uh, maybe I will just Take add it. to mm -hmm. that. So the super important part is that uh, most of the security issues should be reported privately. So you don't tell about that everyone, like in a public security, public uh, GitHub issues or discussions. Uh, it's just reported using the process which uh, which maintains the privacy or the uh, like. The, the, you don't tell everybody else, 
because if this is disclosed, it might pose a danger for uh, for others that somebody will ex exploit it. So this is like super important to follow the process and and just not to tell everyone, <laughs> even if uh, this is this is basically. Pretty much any, uh, pretty much everything in Apache Software Foundation is uh, is publicly available, except this. Except this is like one of the very few exceptions. Uh, the discussions about security issues should be kept private as long as uh, as possible. Okay, so the flow is there. I vulnerable. Mm. I, I think we're losing Tomek. <laughs> uh, am I or not? Uh, we, we, we've lost the question. Uh, uh, you were okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, so I will, I will repeat. So, uh, so the flow is that uh, that's where I should report the, uh, and then I report this issue. I probably should put some information. There can be a form to, I believe, uh, in the Apache on the Apache page, and what happens next? Like, is every security vulnerability addressed, or we somehow evaluate them, or it's just like everything is accepted? What What are the next steps that are not visible to uh, to not to people not being a PMC or security uh, from the Apache Air Software Foundation? Ash, can you chime in? Yeah. So um, we get a we the the PMC get a get an email from passed on from the security team at Apache. They do a kind of tertiary pre-filtering, um, and it's then up to us as the PMC to decide how to handle it. So often, that will either be one of two cases: either it's a bug in our code, in which case we'll kind of look at it and go, "Yeah, this is a security vulnerability," and we'll kind of work start working on a fix or discuss a fix. The other thing that happens fairly regularly, um, particularly in the world of open source, is that the vulnerability is actually in a dependency of ours. Um, most commonly, it's somewhere in the fab stack, the Flask application builder, um, because web, you know, web has lots of vulnerabilities. If you, there's just so many, easy, so many ways you can make silly mistakes that can make you vulnerable. Um, so it's like either it's already patched and we just need to update, or we go like, yeah, sorry, that's a bug. You have to go tell Project X. Um, for the ones which we handle ourselves, um, we kind of will sort of reply back to the, the original poster going, yeah, that, that sounds like a bug. Um, and here's the CVE that Apache have alloc allocated. Um, how would you like to be credited when we disclose it? We then go through, get that um, fixed. Um, so that you know that change will land onto the main branch. Will then, most likely, almost certainly, in fact, backport that, cherry pick that to our release branch for the current release. So right now, that's the two point one release series. Um, go through the kind of normal dance of getting released, released and tested, and then once it's released and people have had a chance to update, that is the point that we disclose the CVE and we pu publicly tell people. There's a vulnerability you should update to 2.1 point. Well, one's a current version. There weren't any CVs in that, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm wondering is like, uh, you have to fix this security vulnerability somehow. Like you said that you are doing the back fix, but the repo is uh, publicly uh, available to everyone. So how you yeah. uh, handle that? Like, probably we should not, we don't do a PRs like, Hey, fixing this CVE, that's, that is not that it's not. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, you, you don't mention in the commit message that this is a security fix. Um, if people are observant, you can kind of spot which ones are and which ones aren't. But uh, so to some extent, we have to rely on security by obscurity or obscurity to not zero day our own users. Because, you know, mm -hmm. but ha having a, hey, this is a CVE fix for an unpublished CVE, that's a kind of a big sign to anyone paying attention, and they can then go and exploit that against all our users. Yeah, we we don't want to do that. That would be bad. Um, so yeah, you just kind of go, "Hey, I'm fixing this," and then it just looks like a normal PR. Um, and then when it's all, all released, it, that's the point. You go, "This was a security fix." Yeah, 
Got it. And 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 I think just to add to that is like security is very uh, rarely is like zero one game. So it's it's more about like you know just getting delay of informing informing that this is actually security is enough uh, in many cases. It's like without explicitly sp stating that this is fixing the the problem. So maybe one more question regarding the process: how usually how long usually it takes to. Uh fix a security vulnerability. Let's say that we I reported this now and when this fix will be released. So maybe Dolef, maybe you can tell your experience, both from, from Airflow and from others. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Uh, so I would say, you know, when I worked with the, the Airflow team on, on security issues, the, the response was immediate, right? The acknowledgement whether this is an issue or not was almost like within a few hours. Um, so the whole that that whole process is, is at least the acknowledgement if this is an issue or not is relatively quick. And then the question is well, how how bad is the bug? And you know if it requires uh, architectural changes, then it's going to take longer. But if it's, it's something that is kind of an easy patch, that might not take very long. But it also depends on the severity because the severity ultimately decides you know the urgency of how quickly we can push that out. And, and also how easy is, is it to exploit the bug uh, in reality? Uh, so you know, we, we need to assume that there are a lot of airflow instances publicly facing. So if we do encounter something that can harm an airflow instance, then now it's just a matter of time. Um, so there's a, you know, the responsibility of the vendor, but there's also the responsibilities of the users to actually you know, tune into these uh, update channels on new releases and patch whenever they can and simply maybe not expose airflow to the internet, but that's a different discussion. Yeah, right. So th this is exactly what I wanted to ask because uh, if, if the we as a project fix the security issue, uh, it doesn't mean that all the uh, occurrences of this issue will be fixed because uh, I don't think that this cast now important to keep your airflow up to date. I think here is a example from Udolev uh, about, uh, I think it was the CVE about uh, using the default uh, uh, the default key to sign the cookie, the one from Flask other, which was reported, but there were still instances uh, that were vulnerable to that. Can you describe so, how you uh, found it out? So I, I wasn't the one who found that particular bug. Um, probably uh, uh, you know, okay. the team here can speak more about like the handling of it. But it, that was a you know a pretty okay. interesting bug. Um, you know, and if the, the person behind uh, you know the the user hasn't changed it, then their problem. And you know, there's nothing that the vendor can do at this point other than <laughs> you know, just sending out notifications that, hey, we have an issue, keep in mind that you need to change that. So I'll let the other talk about that particular Yeah, part. yeah, I'll, 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 I'll maybe I'll talk about that because that was the, the main kind of trigger for the blog post which I wrote to Apache mm -hmm. Center Foundation. So Ian, Ian Carroll was the security researcher who, who discovered it. And, and he, well, not discovered, actually, he, uh, it was discovered long before, but Ian, just took the report and he, which was public already, because we released a new version of, of Airflow, which, which was fixing the problem. But he was just scanning all the other, all the all the publicly available Airflow instances to find out who didn't patch yet, and he found a number of companies, and he actually uh, raised some bounties. So, like he raised, he got thirteen thousand dollars from bounties because he was reporting those problems to to the companies which were running uh, Airflow in this way, uh, which was still old and not passed to the latest one. So the only thing he did is just flag them that they should upgrade, but they could do that themselves. So this is like this is super important for the users to, to pay attention and to upgrade uh, because because otherwise somebody can just scan and find out that they are running the old version of, of software, which is not patched. Yeah. And um, I, I will right. also the funny thing is that today it's Sorry, I'll, I'll let Ash talk first. Um, it was just a point. So when, when that when that vulnerability came up, um, it was some point in one point ten, I think. Yep. Um, and it was kind of like an oh my god moment of like this is really bad. Um, and Action and I did a search and found about forty people with public ones and went and told them to patch. So I'm kind of kicking ourselves that we didn't report. You know, try to report and, and get some bounty ourselves. 
yeah. 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 One thing I'll point out that today it's very, very cheap to scan, mass scan the internet. Four billion addresses to scan it, it's a matter of hours, if not less. There are tools that the security you know, industry is developing to be able to kind of map how bad the internet is or the state of, of the internet is. And, and scanning the internet at, at that scale is, is, not, is not hard. And it's actually mm -hmm. very cheap. So you know, if we, if we do encounter a vulnerability at that scale, um, then finding all the publicly facing instances of Airflow or whatever software it is that has a you know, specific interesting bug is really a matter of an hour, maybe less, um, just, just as an FYI. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is a really good uh, point that uh, our users should keep the dependencies, especially the Airflow up to date. and. This, I think, move us smoothly to uh, the fact that 1.10 uh, version is uh, and uh, reached its uh, end of life, I think, about a month ago. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, do I correctly understand that there won't be any security uh, patches to this version? Is that correct, Ash? Yeah. Um the Apache, the Apache Airflow project is not going to make any more releases to 1.10, um, even if it's like remote code execution, anyone can access all your data. Like, don't get me wrong, we don't know of any. Um, but if that were to happen, we're not. We we're almost certainly not. I'm not going to say we're not, but we're almost certainly not going to release a patch because at this point, if you were going to update, you probably updated 2.0 already. It's been out for uh, almost eight months at this point. So the one, the one to like, I know there are still some people on one O and one point ten are still moving, but yeah, they kind of like you've had enough chance to update. If we released a fix of one ten, you're just not updating, so it wouldn't help anyway. So yeah, I'm afraid one point ten end of life, not even receiving security fixes from the Apache project anymore. Yeah, right. And so, let let me just. Mm -hmm. Let me just add to that because, like, I continue getting we continue getting like uh, reports of pro of problems and bugs and uh, and kind of like yeah I'm running Airflow one dot ten something and uh, this doesn't work so I already got into the habit of just responding first thing Airflow one dot ten reached the end of life at June seventeenth and please upgrade as soon as possible <laughs> yeah because because this is so important this is so so important actually the the, the CV that Dolef reported, and that's where we got into the, the, the first contact, was, was actually the first CV uh, that has not been patched, had not, has not been fixed in Airflow 1.10. Uh, it was fixed in, in 2. Uh, I can't remember which version, but it was fixed there. Uh, but it's, it will never be fixed in 1.10 unless somebody does it themselves. Uh, but no Airflow, like Apache Airflow community will not mm -hmm. do that. I think this this CV was really interesting. Can you all uh, tell us more about that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the vulnerability happened to be not in, like in Airflow core like software, but something like that. Re Airflow relies very heavily on, which is a Flask app builder. Uh, so the authorization and authentication aspect is is handled by that. Um, and, and and the issue is not as severe as like something like a hard coded key. Um, so so it's really more about getting insight into the uh, users, the accounts that are configured behind uh, behind Airflow, that would give you a leverage if you're trying to get access to an Airflow instance. Um, so, kind of in a nutshell, the, the the problem was that when you specify a user that doesn't exist, the whole hashing aspect that happens behind the scene obviously is not happening because you just look up the user, the user doesn't exist, so you're not going into the path of checking the password. But when you hit a user that does exist, you go into the hashing matching flow, uh, and that adds some latency, right? So you can, based on the response, determine when a user exists and doesn't exist. Uh, so that was fixed, and and we worked uh, we worked with the with the uh, third party library uh, vendor, uh, the person behind that. Uh, and, you know, it was fixed. It was fixed within probably just a few days. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just just to uh, you know make sure people are not like scared or anything. I think it's you know on the severity scale, probably like a medium low kind of thing. Um, it's not as severe as other things, 
uh, just good to keep in mind that uh, you know that that specific bug is not going to be addressed in you know older versions. So. Okay, so I think it's a. Uh... One more time, we said that it was not an airflow issue, but an, an issue in the third party dependency. And this is really important topic, I think, because now with, uh, I think like more than 20 providers, I believe, uh, we we are going to have a lot of third party dependency. 62, okay. So uh, with 62 uh, providers, so it means at least 62 third party dependencies, I assume. Uh, it means that the chance of introducing a security vulnerability, not also, not mainly, not more, maybe into the air, the core of the airflow, but to the operator's hook, hooks uh, is growing. So uh, is there anything like where we, where is the, uh, where is the, uh, barrier between what we care as the Apache Airflow project and what we don't fix because it's a vulnerability in the third party uh, library. Uh, just just to add to that, like we have 500 dependencies in total, uh, more or less. The, this is something I track very, very rigorously for, for because we are continuously upgrading those dependencies. So this is like part of the Airflow uh, setup is that we are upgrading to the highest uh, uh, version of every dependency that is released fairly quickly after it is released. And this is, pre this is an automated project, uh, automated pro process in our CI. So this is the like, big part of like making sure that we are updated, including, for example, when our images are, are released, including the base image that we are using for uh, releasing the software, like latest uh, patched Python version is always used whenever we build the image. Uh, so this is part of like where we do a reasonable effort to make sure that we are upgrading to whatever is possible. Uh, but uh, but of course there might be some things that we cannot upgrade because you know like we are pinned to a lower version of, of dependency. If this is something remotely exploitable or exploitable through Airflow, we always take responsibility to at least uh, communicate with the, uh, the the third party like it happens with flask application builder from the dollars case so we investigated we see we saw that we cannot fix it that somebody else has to fix it and we involved third party or the the, the, the author who happens to be another apache software foundation uh committer and pmc member because he's also committing to superset to apache superset project which is they are also going to talk about uh, superset during the the talk and they are they are the the sponsor of overflow summit uh and they uh, they took the responsibility and fixed it together with us like we we provided the, the fix and the, 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 they they uh, they they accepted it they released the version and then we upgraded to the latest version available so that that happens pretty much every time then we when we see something exploitable for airflow uh, and that's the, the barrier because there are lots of issues which are maybe you know like some software is released with some issue but it doesn't affect airflow it, you cannot actually exploit it via airflow because of, because because of for example like uh, we had a, a caching uh, issue recently and we decided this is not an issue because we are using it in airflow in the way that you cannot really exploit it uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a re real case uh, from like uh, maybe two weeks ago Mm -hmm. right, yeah, so just to, to expand on that a brief, um, Airflow's kind of architecture helps a large part to, to kind of mitigate the risk, and it is just mitigating the risk. Um, like we can't guarantee it, but so the fact that the the web server now doesn't load any DAG codes, which means it doesn't even import any of the any of these dependencies, just don't get imported. So kind of like from from Airflow to over, read everything from the database instead of parsing the DAG files mitigates the risk because the the attack surface for the for the bit that's exposed to the web either you know privately or publicly is greatly reduced um but yes it's just kind of generally a supply chain problem or supply chain attacks in open source software is a hard and unsolved problem um mm -hmm. but yeah so one of the questions that users can ask and i think is ask quite often is if I will go with a managed Airflow service uh, instead of hosting Airflow by my all, by, by myself, will it improve my security? 
or will be just uh, delegating the security, like act, the, 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 taking care of the security to the other people? It doesn't make it worse. Um, yeah, it probably does make it better. Um, so um, it, it kind of depends on, on on which one, but to some extent, you are you are all of the the managed providers, of which yeah, by all I mean Amazon, Google, and Astronomer. Um, they all kind of have their own kind of images or distribution kind of. Yes, yeah. they all have versions of Airflow which they manage that base layer of security for you, make sure that it stays up to date, make sure that there are no known kind of vulnerabilities. So yes, by using a managed one, you have some of that burden taken away from you. Um, you can't abdicate all responsibility. Um, Amazon kind of famously, one of their security policies is kind of like shared responsibility. So it's like, we'll manage the base layer, but like the top level, what's running inside it and what your application does, that's up to you. Um, where that line is drawn for you know, managed airflow is slightly less clear, but it's still Amazon or Google or Astronomy take care of some of that for you. But you would still kind of, you should be aware of what you're running on the internet. Um, it's just a sad fact of life in, you know, 2021 that if it's on the internet, it's going to get attacked um, by automated scripts and dedicated, you know, malicious people. So, you're running things. You got to. You got to know. You got to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, this. I. I believe this is really important, and I think that the shared security is a really interesting concept, especially in the airflow where we have the DAX that can run any arbitrary, uh, arbitrary code, which can also drop the database that we use. So it's not only about the vulnerabilities from out, outside, but also possible uh, issues from the inside. And this is a question to Dolev. Uh, how do you think about like being our workflows written in Python and being able to execute uh, any codes uh, that, we, that you users know, would like to do? You know, as, as you were talking about this, uh, it's almost like if you find a vulnerability that gives you code execution, it's not that exciting because the whole platform is supposed to execute code, right? <laughs> it's, it's the truth. Um, and I think, and it's a hard problem to solve, right? Because if you allow code execution, then you allow code execution. There's so so many things can go wrong. But I think you need there's I think the platform gives you uh, flexibility when it comes to doing you know role based based access control and granularity around you know what DAGs you can see, what DAGs you can you know all that stuff is available to you. So make use of it. Um, but it, you know it's also ultimately up to the you know the user to make sure that. You know the, the the credentials that are being used in the DAGs are doing only that specific thing that they're supposed to do, and there's you know it's it's not different than like monitoring systems in that sense, right? Monitoring systems authenticate to you know switches or routers or other things, and and need to do some task, get some metrics, and and you know report back. It's it's pretty much the same in that sense. You you, you do some you take some. Uh, uh, I guess uh, sensitive action with credentials, and and that's the purpose of the system. Um, so there is some responsibility on on at least trying to stick to like the least privilege model, where you only do what use what's necessary. Same thing with uh, you know the the UI itself, need to know basis. If you have a user that only needs access to you know, one thing in that system, then only do that. Uh, so there are, you know, out of the box capabilities that allow you to minimize that that impact, um, but it, it is a tough problem, uh, you know, as, as long as the system is supposed to do, uh, like, to execute code at the end of the day. Yes, I, I think this is this is really good good point, and I, I sometimes when I see the security discussion, I and uh, users forgetting about that the airflow is a. Platform to execute the code. It's it's sometimes funny to see like that they d don't see this uh, particular vulnerability, like this feature as a vulnerability. But anyway, uh, there is a question uh, from the audience about uh, if doing rolling releases uh, can ensure that the uh, that that we install the latest security updates. Rolling release are... model. Yeah, exactly. well, uh, uh, the question, uh, that, what does rolling release model means? Uh, it's like, 
it's if if it's like you know if you are just updating the, to the latest version of Airflow, uh, and we are making sure that uh, the, the issues that we are aware of are addressed in the latest um, minor release of Airflow, so like 2.1 series, uh, and we are also making sure that these uh, these really these minor versions of airflow are easy to upgrade to and and you should just do that just 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 update as soon as possible because then you will be mm -hmm. sure that uh that security is at the highest possible level that we know about right now mm -hmm. so uh, so if that was the question about the rolling release model um, okay. I, th I think also if you could explain about the constraints file, that's probably a useful follow on to that point file. So, yeah, you know, what we do there to manage things. Yep. So uh, the constraint files, which we, we have a very special way of, of uh, deciding which dependencies are good for Airflow and which are not. Uh, because uh, because Airflow has so many complex uh, dependencies and, and so many of them. So we have like constraint files, which whenever you install Airflow, it is like the, the good set of dependencies which are install uh, which for this particular version of airflow will make sure that you can install it that it works but those constraint files are not limiting you so you are not limited to those versions of Airflow of dependencies you can always upgrade to the higher versions of, of those dependencies so especially when there is a new uh, dependency release which fixes security vulnerability you don't have to wait for a new version of airflow you can you can upgrade those dependencies uh, on your own and airflow has limitations like like what it allows to upgrade but it doesn't constrain you to this or doesn't limit you to this particular version that it, it was installed initially so this is this is a, a good thing that if you're maintaining it on your on your own and in, on premises then you can you can easily upgrade all the dependencies on your own depending how you do it uh, in, in general for all your software mm -hmm. so many companies have their own uh, versions of like how they are maintaining and how they are upgrading the software mm -hmm. yeah here i think it's worth to mention that with uh Adoption of 2.0 version of the Apache Airflow. Uh, the Apache Airflow project decide to follow the sem uh, semantic versioning releases, which means that updating from the minor to minor version should be smooth. Uh, that doesn't didn't have to be the case in case of 1.10 uh, branches. So here, I think it's really really important to remember about that uh, because being up to date is much more easier done. Uh, than a year ago. Yes, uh, okay. we are very ser very serious about backwards compatibility in two uh, series. So basically, anything we release into should be backwards compatible. There might be bugs, which uh, regressions, which we will fix afterwards. But if if they are changing the behavior, mm -hmm. then we will fix them in the follow up following releases. So so you, you should expect that things do not uh, the new things will appear, but the old things will not disappear or will change. So here is a related question. Uh, how often the breaking changes occur in, in Apache Airflow project? By uh, intentional breaking changes, um, 0. And the next ones will be whenever we decide to release 3.0. There will not be any breaking changes that we know about um, before Apache 3.0. Um, one person's bug fix can be another person's breaking change. So it's never a clear cut, this is a breaking change or a bug fix, because if you're relying on the current behavior and we change it because it's fixing a bug, have we fixed the bug or have we broke something? But like big scale breaking changes, that's, you know, that we do by design, that will be whenever we release um, Apache 3.0. We're following Semver, so it's that simple. When will that be? Um, let catch my talk next week. <laughs> and uh, okay. just to add to that, just to add to that, because you mentioned before the the providers we have, so we ha we have actually hmm. sixty or seventy now providers, and then those providers themselves then can ha they can have breaking changes. It doesn't change airflow, doesn't make introduce breaking change to airflow, but also you can upgrade and downgrade those providers separately. So so you don't have when you upgrade uh, just provider or just airflow, you 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 can you can go very freely between the different versions so so you will have some breaking changes in the operators integration with external services but not in the airflow itself and you can still upgrade airflow to latest version and keep the older version of providers with a few exceptions uh maybe in the future 
but generally speaking, you should be able to keep the old version of providers and new version and, and latest version of Airflow with all the security fixes. So mm -hmm. it's very, very flexible actually, and very uh, kind of fine grained. So you can you can you can either go full on and upgrade everything, or you can fine grainedly upgrade only parts that are, that that you really need to, or you know that there is security vulnerability in them. Okay. The, there was also the question that we uh, answered at the beginning of the talk. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the policy for, for disclosing newly, newly discovered vulnerabilities? Would it hurt uh, the project if they were released to the public without notifying Apache Prior? Uh, so uh, as we discussed this at the beginning, the answer is yes, it would. Uh, it would hurt our community because uh, the vulnerabilities should be reported privately uh, so we can take uh, correct action to fix them without disclosing them uh, before the uh, fix for, for the issue. So th there is one interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I fully understand it, but uh, how would adoption of software bills of materials affect the security and development of Airflow? So, for I'm, those not, not familiar, a software bill, bill of materials is to some extent our constraint fund. It's here's, um, I'm laughing at Yarek's camera because he's just blurred. Um, a software <laughs> bill, bill of materials is here's every open source project, here's mm -hmm. all the components and the components that they pull in and, and so on. It's like your transitive dependency tree. Um, it's just an easy way of, um, no, it's supposed to be like, here's everything that goes into make this Docker file. So we've got all the Python modules, we've got the system libraries, um, we've got these node modules because we use, or JavaScript, we, you know, we use node for building the, the assets, but we don't use it at runtime. So that kind of thing. Um, how does it affect Airflow? How does it affect the security of Airflow? I think it kind of like well we've already we've already got one by another name. It's not a complete one. Um, it also then depends on what what artifact are you producing a a, a bomb a bill of materials for? Um, is it the Python wheel? Is it the source tardz? Is it the Docker file at the end? Um, does it change anything? I'll let Dollar try and answer that one. <laughs> I don't have a strong opinion on this. I think uh, I, I don't know if it changes anything. Yeah, I mean, like there, there are lots of automated tools. Kind of, you know, you pick a one of your security scanners of choice, whether it's you know, Snip, Twist, Lock, Docker's built-in thing, if that still exists. They all build up this build of materials on demand anyway. So it's possibly a useful tool in the toolbox, but it doesn't change anything. It's not the only thing to do. It's so it's. Yeah, maybe it helps for some cases or some workflows, but. Yeah, and uh, my comment is like, it's like the, this kind of scans that are scanning everything. Uh, I, I had some experience with uh, with some software like that, which, which, which does the bill of material. Uh, it was Black Duck, I think that was the, the one that I used. So it, it, it brings you a lot of uh, false positives. And I think so, sometimes false positives are worse than, than, than having uh, not enough information because they, they can actually hide uh, the real security issues. So, so uh, really, uh, in our case, we are paying attention as a, as a project to whatever dependencies we have. And we, we are being informed and we are maintaining that so like you can rely on whatever we publish like as a security vulnerabilities and 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 what uh, our reaction to that and and this is the uh, this is the most important part it's also like the statement from the uh, apache security team they whenever we get a report from the bill of materials like this is this is like we found all these issues the response usually we get from them is like guys those are most of them false positive. Like just just go and pick those that are really important and and report them individual to us. So whenever you report a problem to Apache Security, they will not even let you report a kind of bunch of problems from coming from the security scan. It's just one CVE or one report per email, and and that that that, that actually is, is a very good idea. I think, I, I think the, the just to add on that, I think like. For a company that, let's say, just adopted 
Airflow and they want to experiment with it. And the security team is like doing their due diligence and run a bunch of scanners at, at Airflow, right? You need people that can translate what they see to actual risk. Um, you know, a lot of software that is heavily vetted and even websites, you will run a scanner against them, something will be found, whether it's missing headers or some other best practice that maybe you don't really care about. It also depends on, on, the, on the context and, and how the application is actually deployed. Um, so I think that there is certain, I think the chances of finding like a zero day or something very, very severe just from running like a black box scan against Airflow, I mean, it's possible, but I don't have, I, you know, I've, I've worked with scanners uh, in my life. They don't tend to do that. Uh, they don't tend to just give you like a serious problem right off the bat, uh, unless that you know that application was never ever scanned in in, in the in, in its entire life cycle. Um, so you know the the low hanging fruit, I would say. I mean, it's worth raising. That there's no reason why you shouldn't raise it. Worst case, it gets you know kind of dismissed, like hey, we we don't care about that. Or you know, I think that the security person on the other end also needs to like acknowledge. The, kind of do like a self-assessment. Is it actually risky? Yes or no? And then decide on whether to report. I think it's good to report if you have a doubt and you're not sure and you need to get like another opinion on it. So, you know, report. I think it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Both sides learn about something. Um, so that's my take on just running scanners against uh, software. There was an interesting yeah. blog post I read this morning, um, which was called NPM Audit Broken by Design. So NPM Audit is a tool built into NPM, the JavaScript package manager, or the Node package manager, the default one that most people use. Um, NPM Audit checks the database of um, vulnerabilities and says, um, yeah, that you know, here are five high vulnerabilities. Um, it is just on by default, but it, you end up with kind of alert blindness because it says you if you run create the, the react create react app react app um kind of helper thing it tells you you have five high vulnerabilities and they're all false positives there's like it what like three of the like two of them are the same and the other three are um uh, regular expression denial of service kind of resource con consumption things it's like that doesn't apply in this context because i'm running it locally and like this is the kind of problem with automated tools uh, which is Context matters a lot, and automated tools just can't can't tell that. So yeah, um, I've dropped the link to that blog post in the Slack channel already. So talking about security scanning, uh, one application of them uh, which can be quite interesting. I'm not sure if valid, but would be to run them on CI, for example, for the new docs uh, that are deployed by the users that doesn't have to be security experts. Would that be a valid approach? Do, what do you think, Dolev? I think that I think it's an interesting idea, uh, like a linting DAG and, and kind of figuring out best practices. I think that's something that, I mean, I think it would provide value. Uh, the the credentials that are being used maybe a, a linter won't do much telling you know to tell you like oh you're using higher permission than you should maybe you know that's a little bit like a different approach maybe I don't know maybe it is possible uh, I think there could be value in, in in auditing and I think a DAG should be you know peer reviewed just like any other thing in, in that you do um, same with the credentials that are being used um, but I think just following best practices. I think I see an opportunity there to like build some kind of a custom linter to tell you about something that you should maybe you should do something different. Um, but I'll let yeah. the the uh, I'll let you guys kind of talk about whether you think that there are you know best practices that can be enforced this way. Yeah, I th I think so. Uh, the there are, there are class of problems that can be very easily detected. Like for example, like committing a, a, a private key into the repository. So this is something that GitHub already does, or or is they are trying to do automatically, uh, because then there are like number of people scanning all the GitHub repositories and trying to find out like, the the private keys. So they are trying to prevent that from happening. And and this is actually very very cool. And those those ideas are are cool. And 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 those classes of problems are a number of the, those that you can you can you can detect but don't try to to overdo it the, the peer review is, is is the important part because because it's uh, it's so easy to you know sneak in some things that you will not be able to detect 
uh, so so peer peer review uh, having a, a, another eyeball uh, before uh, things go into the branch which is actually deployed to Airflow. This is this is this is great thing that that should happen uh, always. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a uh, pipeline I, project called mm -hmm. Bandit which does some of these simple checks. Um, I've seen it. I've never used it. So if you want to try something out, look at that project. It may do some of this for you. Right. So I, I fully support that probably the best way would be to have a good code review uh, to see that if if they not. So we have four minutes. Uh, there is one more question, not uh, related to the security, but uh, the question is, if we are migrating to the newest release of Airflow, uh, what are the steps we need to ensure that existing workflow is not broken? Any best practices? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the whole the whole set of uh, you know upgrade to two dot zero, migrate to two dot zero, uh, uh, walk through basically, and even tools, which I think Tom, Tomek, you you wrote a big part of it, which checks if the if you are ready for migration to to to, to the zero, uh, and I, I think it's just to just follow it like we spent enormous time of the community to prepare this kind of migration and uh, and prepare for for migration and make sure that it's as painless as possible. Mm -hmm. From my side, I would add that probably a multitude of the issues, especially with hooks and operators, could be mitigated if we have more users testing uh, the code before releasing, uh, not only being the consumers of them, but also the active uh, community members. But anyway, we have two minutes left. I'm really happy uh, that you were my guest. Uh, I believe it was really an interesting discussion uh, thank you all uh, for your time. Uh, I believe that users will, the attendees will still be able to ask you questions on the Slack. Uh, so uh, thank you one more time and see you probably maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, and just one, one so thing much. from me, for, just one thing I would like to add, upgrade mm -hmm. to Airflow 2.0 uh, two, two and uh, 2 plus. Sure. Yeah, the latest version. This is this is super important. Like, really, mm -hmm. you are on your own. And just one thing to add as well: like the the, the benefit of managed services for Airflow uh, is is also like that. There are some SLAs that those managed services have, and they can upgrade uh, and uh, update uh, security fixes on their own. They are not from community. So if you are on those managed services, just follow what they tell you in terms of like, okay, this is this is like you must upgrade now because we will not provide any more security fixes as well. But if you are on your own, upgrade to, to, to right now, because you won't be able to cope with all those security fixes, which you will have to fix yourself, pretty much. Right. So the message is upgrade to 2.0. Uh, 2.1, even now. 2.1, 2.1, 2.1. Yeah. 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 I think the message should be updated <laughs> to the latest version of the Apache version, uh, Apache Airflow. Uh, so. We have one more session for today, uh, and we are about to play it. And please stay, uh, stay, us, stay with us to watch uh, the upcoming session. Thank you, and see you. Thank you, everyone.